Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I think we should go ahead and get started. People will join as, as time goes. Um, let's see. All right. Um, my name is Molat Munyani, and I work for the Africa Center for Gene Technologies uh, as, a, as a program manager. I manage a, a lot of, 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 of programs and projects within the, the omics space, uh, genomics, metabolomics, uh, metagenomics, etc. Um, we've been, I am also a member of the Committee of Directors for MSA, and I sit on a couple of uh, subcommittees uh, just to help out. Um, the ACGT has been part of this MSA journey from, from, from the beginning up to this point. And we have to say, we feel the, the society has grown in, in, in this time uh, and it's building a nice record with, with the, the workshops we've held, the symposiums, um, the weekly uh, general clubs and all the other events that are available. So this is just one of those uh, events that we felt uh, needed to happen early in the year, uh, particularly because we feel it caters for people that are um, very early in their in their professional careers. Uh, it also serves um, people that may need a refresher. It also serves people that may be interested in certain aspects of the topics that will be discussed today. Um, so we, we we're hoping that you guys will benefit from from today's session. So we hope we can keep a, a classroom uh, atmosphere uh, with questions and, and comments as we go along. We try and be mindful of our mics and videos just not to be disruptive. Uh, I will first start by introducing our, I guess, let me first start with uh, the, explaining what the program will be for today. We essentially have three sessions. Uh, we have the morning session, uh, which will be led by Dr. Marie Vatvek. Uh, and then we'll have the mid-morning session, which will be um, uh, led by Dr. Wilma Augustine. And then in the evening, in the afternoon, we'll, we'll, we'll finish off with uh, Dr. Maxine Sandasi from TUT. Um, and, and these are the topics that will be covered. We'll, we'll try and, and keep to the time, uh, but please forgive us if we, 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 we are not very on point with that, but we'll try, we'll try. Um, so I'll first start by introducing our first speaker uh, from Northwest University, uh, who's, who's held a few of these before for us, uh, and, and, and I'm sure some of you are very familiar with her work. Um, during her tenure, tenure as a consulting statistician at the Department of Statistics and resident uh, biostatistician, uh, the focus area and center of human metabolomics, uh, Dr. Marie Van Beek has encountered all sorts of study designs spinning the uh, psychological to the biological, in vitro to in vitro, in vivo to in vitro, uh, plants to mammals and urine to breast milk. She has tackled data produced by diverse measurements instruments, by diverse measurement instruments from questionnaires to targeted and untargeted GL, GC, LC, and NMR. In her talk, she will share with some of you some of the tricks and, of the trade specifically when it comes to valid research in metabolomics. And we hope you will be able to benefit from this session. Uh, I'll stop sharing now, uh, Marie, and hope that you enjoy your giving us this session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to check, are you seeing my email? <laughs> or are you seeing a blank screen? I am seeing a big brain. A big brain, awesome. That's what I want you to see. It's mine, can't you see? No, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, okay, so let me start. Um, so this has not been pre-recorded, as you can see. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Okay, so today I'm talking to you um, about some of the considerations uh, when it comes to designing metabolomics um, experiments. So welcome to the talk and um, Thank you for having me. Um, as uh, the intro just said, <laughs> I'm a, actually a statistician. Um, so I'm not a lab expert, uh, nor do I have a really a biological background. What I do have is experience um, in lucky breaks, in epic fails, and even a few gold stars. 
<laughs> when it comes to metabolomics research. Okay, also, I've plagiarized a lot in the context, in the content of this um, presentation. Um, so everything is quoted almost directly. <laughs> so you can trust that what I say in what I say because others have said it also. Okay, this presentation uh, will look at some of the essentials of design. Um, there are heaps and heaps of information out there, and I encourage you to have a look for yourself. What I then hope to achieve today is basically two things just to create some awareness um, of the complexity of design, and if nothing else, to provide you with a list of search words so you can go and help yourself further. Okay, so studying design comprises of two aspects, experimental design and measurement design. Now, then the, the aim of design boils down to either increasing the signal or decreasing the noise. Essentially, you wanna do both simultaneously. Experimental design aims to emphasize um, the variation that, that's directly associated with your research question. That's the variation of interest, right? Um, but it also tries uh, to dim the naturally occurring variation that's not really of interest to you. Measurement design, on the other hand, um, aims to add as little measurement um, error as possible, right? So um, measurement design is not necessarily about, about focusing in on some sort of signal, but it's more about not wanting to add any measurement error and um, avoiding any undue variation due to handling and so forth. Um, okay. Your study design fails when the noise outweighs the signal and you end up feeling like this. Let's see if that works. <laughs> okay, cat's not very impressed. Right, okay. so. Now, I did warn you uh, about the plagiarizing directly, so here we go. Um, I wanted a precise description of what we're up against, so I decided it would be safer to quote the experts, at least in part. So, the study design is essential to make sure that the samples are collected, that are collected, reflect, and represent the biology in question. Um, and to examine the most influential factors that are relevant to the hypothesis under investigation, external factors that can affect the experiment must um, or have to be eliminated or identified so that they can be accounted for during data analysis. Now take note, um, data that reflects that do not by default represent, if that makes sense. So just because a change might be reflected in your data does not mean that you can generalize beyond your data set. So that's the first thing that you need to be aware of. Then also, what you can't control, you have to collect data on. So if you can't eliminate it, you have to account for it. So that means you have to um, collect data on it. Right, so I'm quoting on. <laughs> um, noise or error distorts the signal in your data. So you get two sources of noise. You get ra random noise and systematic noise. Now round random noise is actually your worst enemy because it's, uh, it's technical in nature. Um, and it can, it can be, for example, um, instrument signal spikes um, and discontinuous data that's mistaken for meaningful um, information. Systematic noise is external factors that are not relevant, but cloud the effects of the factors that are of interest. Now, the main thing is you can measure and adjust for systematic noise, but only to some extent. Um, and when it comes to random noise, the only thing you can do is manage it. Um, what you fail to control before data collection, can it be adjusted for after when it comes to random noise? Okay. So how do we go about this? How do we design experiments? Um, okay. So firstly, how do you increase the signal and decrease the noise? Uh, your first line of defense is usually power. Um, ensure your study is sufficiently powered. That is, um, get a large enough sample size. A strong signal, in my opinion, is more fruitful than trying to identify and control all sources of noise. Um, it's not really possible. You can imagine all the sources of noise. Um, so this is, however, a thorn in the side of metabolomics. You can get away with smaller sample sizes if you use intervention studies, if you measure the same subject repeatedly, um, and if you try to make your groups as homogeneous as, as possible, so you can do this by setting uh, strict selection criteria. Um, so the, the idea is that the less variation within your group, the better. This places greater emphasis on the between group differences, which you're actually interested in. So um, 
like Malati said last year, I did a presentation that focused in a little bit more on discs, and I'm, I think it should be available somewhere. So I'm going to leave it here, um, and then you can go and look at the, the specific experimental designs um, in that, or there's a lot of literature on this in any case. Okay, so um, let's continue with how do you get to this. <laughs> um, sorry. My screen is a bit blurry at the moment. I just want to check, can you guys still see? I think it's just my screen. Okay, in any case, um, let's, let's continue. Um, the only thing that you can do is to give it your best, right? So make sure that you have the best biological matrix for your research question. Um, using urine to characterize a central nervous system disease, for instance, might not be ideal. Um, stick to best practice as far as you possibly can. Um, when it comes to things like uh, sample collection, transport, storage, prep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and measurements. Obviously, the better you can measure your samples, the, the better um, your chances of making a good and valid discovery. So make sure that your choice of platform makes sense for what you're trying to achieve. Um, and these are the headings that I will basically delve into into the rest of this presentation. All right, so first up, uh, statistical power. I did say it wouldn't, but um, I will kind of hover over it just to make sure everyone still understands why it's so important. Okay, so power, first up, what's the definition? Power is the ability to detect an effect, um, which is usually just the difference between two groups for most of you, um, to detect exists. Uh, so power, sample size, effect size, and your willingness to get it wrong, which is basically are all interlinked and they all impact directly on the validity of your study. So why is power so important? Um, well, it's not just power, as we just saw. So, um, the main reason why human metabolomic studies have a bad rep when it comes to reproducibility of findings is that sample sizes are simply too small. And size does matter in this instance. Um, the number of variables uh, usually far exceed the number of cases. So our samples are just purely outnumbered. Uh, we are often looking for small changes, let's be honest. Sometimes it's just a needle in a haystack. Um, and effects are overshadowed by the business of the human body. Um, and that's why, why I say they raise Waldo in all of this. Um, so we can become optimistic Santas, um, as the cartoon suggests, we're trying to find chimneys during load shedding. Uh, so, yeah, so, so there's not too much that we can do about it. But we have to at least try our best, right? So, so um, we can still get published with small sample sizes. We've seen it all, we've done it all, okay? So, <laughs> but, but, um, but is that okay? Um, so the, the general belief is that if you have a small sample size, then you're going to miss stuff, right? So you'll only go, you're only going to pick up the big things, the, the things that, that leap off the page, like this example of an, of an inborn error of metabolism. It's there or it's not there. Um, so it's clear cut, that's the effect. But what people don't realize is that sometimes over, um, no, sorry, underpowered studies can lead to false discoveries as well. So it's not just that you um, don't have the ability to find an effect. It's also that you might find things that don't really exist. Um, so in some cases, um, you might think it's a valid finding, but in actual case, it's just, just a unicorn, right? So it's at the moment you, you collect new data, then you can't repeat or can't find it again. <sighs> okay. Um, the previous two slides, um, like I said, are from like previous presentations, so you can go into more detail if you, if you want, I can send that to you as well. Um, I do want to mention two tools which we didn't get, touch on last time, which I think are uh, nice to, to know about. And, and if there's time at the end of this presentation, then I might do a demonstration. And these are Metabra Analyst and GStore Power. They're both available, um, freely available. So Metabra Analyst, you, you should have encountered. Um, if you haven't, it's on free online software that you can just upload your data to. And then GStore Power is, a, is an app that you can download and install on your desktop that allows you to, to calculate um, your sample size requirements, given a couple of settings and assumptions. 
Um, so G-stop power is more for univariate analysis, while metaanalyst is obviously focused on more of a multivariate approach. Okay. An alternative though, which I think is the only thing that's truly um, achievable for us, to be honest, is the bottoms up approach. Okay, not bottoms up. Sorry, I had a joke there somewhere. Um, although you might feel like it by now. But the, the idea is, is to um, validate your findings by calculating your power of the fact. <laughs> okay, someone's not muted. Um, all right, so what does this mean? Um, in um, <laughs> you need to be a winner, permit you to think is it just me? Or is someone's phone ringing? All right, okay. Um, so, um, back to, to power and why I say that it's not always possible. Um, for us necessarily to, to get the sample sizes that are required for metabolomic studies. Um, I think we, we're all aware of that, most of us are. Um, we don't have hundreds of thousands of people that you, or, sorry, hundreds you know, thousands of people, we probably will need thousands, to, um, to really make, uh, give your metabolomic studies sufficient power. So what's the answer? Dungeon master. Okay. Carry on. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll look out for these. I don't know what's happening. Okay, as long as you know it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 definitely. There's this okay. the user that's that's been tricky. <laughs> yeah, sorry about okay. that. That's fine. Okay, so I'm just going to read what they say here and then you can pick up from there. Okay, in large scale metabolomic studies, it is assumed that since the number of samples are large, there is sufficient power to detect differences in the metabolites. That's not true for us. Most of our studies are underpowered. Okay. However, some of these studies present differences in over 200 to 250 different metabolites, and some differences are very small, but still seem to be significant. Okay. So some of these studies check each metabolite and find the sample size, um, find out if the sample size was adequate to flag the significant difference. That's a power of at least 80%. And this seems to be a bottom-up approach, which I am not quite used to. So this is the author, which is he is uh, not quite used to this, but I would actually advocate for this. <laughs> okay, so long story short, um, if you, like the most of us, us, you don't have sample sizes that are in, um, that are large enough, um, then the alternative is to do your power calculations afterwards. And if we have time, I'll show, I'll demonstrate this to you at the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, the last three topics that I want to cover here are very intertwined, but I'll try to keep things structured in some way. Uh, so let's look at um, matrix considerations. Um, as I've already mentioned, the matrix should relate to your research question. Don't use a matrix that is unlikely to reflect the variation you're interested in, simply because it's available. Um, and here's some reinforcements from the literature. Okay, the metabolic picture will differ greatly depending on the fluid studied, and so it is imperative to choose the most relevant sample type that will demonstrate the metabolic perturbation. For example, compounds such as fatty acids may not be seen in blood, but uh, may be seen in blood, but not in urine or CSF. Okay, so this is just an example. Um, and I know this seems a bit far-fetched, but I've seen it happen before that people um, have samples available and they try and squeeze as much out of it as they possibly can. And sometimes it's not always um, the best way to do it. Um, other things to consider include your sample stability, the invasive nature of sample collection, uh, the volumes you can reasonably expect to collect from your subjects. Uh, so depending on how, and I think more importantly, where you intend to collect samples, you should go for a matrix that's stable. Right, so rural collection sites imply uh, long transit times. If you're doing self-collection, for instance, um, you might struggle to, to get the collection uh, SOP, um, you know, repeatable. Uh, so, for instance, urine might be okay, but dried blood spots, you, you know, you're not supposed to squeeze the finger and you're not supposed to, it's supposed to drop onto the, the, the paper and so forth. So, um, consider all these things 
as well when you're selecting your matrix. Um, always opt for the least invasive matrix, obviously, um, and make sure you can get sufficient volume. Uh, but I want to get stuck on the, the volume um, point a little bit. Okay, so volume is crucial, um, but you cannot consider it just as it is, I almost want to say. So you have to also consider um, the expected concentrations of the compounds you're interested in, um, the sensitivity of your instrument, and then the workup that will be required. So remember, the more you work on a sample, the more workup you have to do, the more expensive usually the method, and the more room there is for error. Um, also, if your samples are, are rare, so if you work in rare diseases like we do, um, then you have to consider compromising on the method um, just to use the least volume possible. Um, well, of course, if you in, if you use uh, if you make use of mammalian studies or similar studies, then you also have to tread carefully. Okay, so just to bring the message home, here's an example, um, which might be obvious, but um, it didn't immediately occur to me, so hence I'm showing it. So this is an example of cells um, analyzed using ALSI. Um, so just by changing between plates, so let's say so you move to a six well plate from a six well plate to a 96 well plate, or even if you just go from a dish to a six well plate, the impact on your concentration can be dramatic, right? So um, what people sometimes forget is the solvent that's also um, that also needs to be taken into consideration. And then at the end, uh, your concentration of cells might actually be too low um, in this instance to go to, to Alcin. Right, so let's look at best practices. So these are two general topics that, the, that I'm covering last, but um, I'm gonna try to hit on all the important parts. Um, sorry, I just wanna move this out of the way. Um, okay, so let's look, oh, well, sorry, I can't get to my <laughs> slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so let's first look at strategy, right? So the first point, it, it, um, is that you will, at some point in your study, have to decide between targeted and untargeted metabolomics. Well, unless you're rolling in it and you can afford both. Um, if so, please don't divulge this information to me unless you're willing to share. In any case, um, so what's the difference? Um, metabolomics uh, usually follows two approaches. It's a global untargeted or a targeted approach. So um, untargeted is usually, we call, talk about hypothesis generating. It's more comprehensive. Um, it's uh, correlated to databases and libraries, um, and there's a, there's a bunch of other things. But the, the main thing is that it's um, people feel that it's more global and that you don't have to know a lot about what you're trying to, to study um, to go this route, hence hypothesis generating. Targeted, on the other hand, is hypothesis driven, so you know what you, you expect and what you're looking for. Um, and then it's uh, absolute quantification and identification is obviously you know the compounds that you're looking at, so you've got 100% ideas, which of course with untargeted methods, you don't often know what exactly the compound is. Um, right, so let me be frank. I'm not a fan of untargeted metabolomics and um, here are my reasons. So once the data arrives, two scenarios usually unfold. If there are compounds that differentiate between the groups or are important or whatever your study research is important to your research question, researchers forget that this whole global thing was a lie, <laughs> okay? Um, you do not have a complete picture. No single instrument can get it all, okay? That's the first thing. Um, it's not a new disease marker. Why? Because you really cannot draw conclusions if your IDs are as tentative as some of these untargeted metabolomics platforms produce. And confirming these IDs is a whole new book. Um, and a lot of the times the IDs just aren't confirmed, right? So researchers get kind of <laughs> excited when it comes to this point. Also, you can't build a predictive model. Why? Because even the quantification is very relative. Sometimes it's only relative to a single internal standard, a bulky big peak slap dab in the middle of your chromatogram. Right, so even that part is not, even though you don't know what it is, even the quantification part is, is relative. Um, on the other hand, if no effect is observed, then researchers tend to blame me, <laughs> they tend to blame the stats. Um, and they forget that the more variables you measure, 
the larger your sample size must be to detect the same size effect. Um, so this is kind of why I'm not such a big fan. Okay. Um, taking strategy a little bit further, and since LC is favored, well, according to literature, I see LC is the, the listed as the biggest untargeted metabolomics platform. Um, here's an LC example, um, which is also kind of <laughs> indicative of why untargeted does not equal global. Um, you should still actually consider which compound groups are of greater importance, again, unless you plan to run multiple experiments. So you can see here in the slide um, that the polarity of metabolites vary quite dramatically. And chromatography, um, your chromatography needs to adjust to this. So they've got a couple of column um, suggestions over here, and then you also have your ionization positive or negative ionization setting that you need to consider because not there's no one size fits all. Um, for all that cover all metabolites. So in my experiment, experience, uh, we run single untargeted experiments. Um, so we do this once, <laughs> not multiple methods. And usually it's a C18 column. Um, unfortunately, like you can see, many of the metabolites of interest, uh, like organic acids and amino acids, are highly polar. Um, so you can see here they suggest a Healy column as an alternative, but this is less reproducible and um, meaning it requires longer recalibration times, more complex modal phases, et cetera. Not really an expert there. Um, but so the bottom line is, un unless you use a few different methods, you st still only get half the global you were promised. OK. Then just a side note on NMR. Um, Although I am a big fan of NMR, and I, and I know that the, the perception is um, that NMR can do both, um, you can analyze on NMR and get untargeted as well as targeted data from it, you have to consider the processing here. So um, if you use BINS data, which is the untargeted version of NMR, then this, this, the data processing side becomes tedious. So you first do statistics, you get your ID compound, you get your concentrations, you repeat your statistics, right? So that's the route there. So it's a lengthy process. You are reliant on the expert expertise, right? So you need an NMR expert. There are alternatives such as basal, but they're not um, for, uh, applicable for all matrices, and it's not bulletproof. Um, and don't forget that you still um, deal with the situation that NMR is not as sensitive as some, as some of the other platforms. That said, even LC, as you can see from that little bar at the bottom, doesn't cover the entire range of concentrations for endogenous metabolites. So the red bit is what LC covers in NMR, maybe covers even less than that. So we are, technology is improving, we're making progress, but we're not there yet. Okay, um, in short, make sure that you know the implication of going the untargeted route. It sounds romantic, but um, may end up not being as romantic. Hypothesis generating, just a side note, hypothesis generating does not mean that whatever you find is publishable. It's only solid if the analysis was at least precise, right? So if you can at least repeat your, your actual findings, your values, um, but you also actually th need to think about accuracy. You can actually only ignore accuracy when you're comparing groups. In fact, this uh, quote, um, maybe I should just read this because it seems that I'm not the only one who feels this way. Um, considering that colleagues' requests to run untargeted metabolomics on a single sample or small sample cohorts should be handled with discussion about experimental design and redirecting to either run exhaustive targeted analyses, or to extend the study population to provide appropriate statistical power. Right, so people want their bread buttered on both sides. They want small sample sizes and all the metabolites they can, they can get. Um, and this, unfortunately, is, is not realistic. OK, so we're stepping away from strategy for a moment, and let's talk about samples. So here's some general advice when it comes to handling matrix matrices. Um, in general, uh, before I read this, uh, good advice for any decision point in study design is to test whatever you decide um, or before you decide. And if uh, you're not able to test, then at least be consistent. Um, right, so if all else fails, meaning that, let's be honest, it's not always your choice to make, at least be consistent when it comes to 
your sample handling, your sample prep, et cetera. All right, so these are some basic guidelines, for example, for, for dry but, uh, blood spots, <laughs> sorry, dry blood spots, um, some uh, how to choose your sample, how to, to um, select between uh, your tubes, for instance. Um, but yeah, maybe I should read this. Sorry, I was almost wondering if I should skip this so I can do the demo, but maybe I should just read this one slide. All right, so dried blood or urine spots are great um, for transportation, um, but you should check the extraction efficiency, right? Because this, again, it, it's extraction efficiency relates to polarity. So again, what um, compounds are you interested in? Uh, choose plasma over serum simply because it can be cooled immediately. Um, but you also have to think about your uh, anticoagulants. Um, there's no definite answer. Some people say ED, EDTA is fine, others hate EDTA. Um, I, I've seen warnings about citrate um, when studying central metabolism. So you can refer to this um, reference at the bottom. We'll go into a little bit more detail. Then urine is favored by most because it's non invasive and it's, it, it's large volumes. Um, but meta metabolite concentrations vary a lot, and even within the same subject. So obviously, you've got this whole urine concentration uh, thing that, that you need to handle, and most people are just normalized relative to creatinine, but this is not always bulletproof, right? So all of a sudden, you, you have to now, in addition, measure creatinine usually, um, or for us, it's a separate method, which means you've got that additional measurement error that you're bringing in. Um, and then obviously, creatinine is not always... Um, accurate, right? So um, if there's any kidney dysfunction at play, then, then obviously creatinine is no longer appropriate to use. Okay, this I'm not gonna read. <laughs> um, so you can, um, I'm assuming the recording of the slides I can make available um, afterwards. So you can go and read into detail um, about the sample handling um, suggestions um, that, that they make. Um, there's a lot of material, like I said, um, out there, and there's a lot of SOPs here. So I'm going to skip over this slightly and just tell you that you really have to look at it and you really need to, to um, I can maybe say this, I read a publication the other day that said, when it comes to, to error or variability in a, in a lab, then the actual analytical variability or the analytical error is only about 10%. Right? The rest is all sample collection, sample handling, et cetera. So don't skip over this. Do the absolute best you can to handle um, and transport and prep these samples to the best of your ability. Um, if, the samples, if the samples are bad, it doesn't matter how the technology improves. Um, so 10 years down the line, if the samples were collected in, in, in badly, then, then the best new instrument is still not gonna, gonna give you what you're looking for. Okay, so that's for some other methods. Um, just something that, um, that I found interesting. Um, again, it's not 100% my field, so, so I'm not sure if this will be interesting to you, but I decided to add it. Um, so if you're, um, you should usually preserve your urine if you're going to leave it, um, for more than two hours. And here's some considerations when it comes to different preservatives. So yeah, it's just a random bit of information, but I found it interesting. So I thought I'd add it here. Okay, um, to get the most from your measurement design, right? So the, the analytical method should be solid. That makes sense. To start with, there obviously has to be an SOP. If there's no SOP, you can stop everything right there and then. Um, the method you plan to use should preferably be validated. Um, and I mean a full analytical validation. So all the parameters of the characteristics of the method are known to you. Uh, you know, how stable um, your auto sample stability, your standard stability, your bias, um, so that you know how to relate your data to reference ranges, et cetera. So that should be there. Um, unfortunately, um, untargeted metabolomics uh, or met the methods really aren't validated yet, I'm saying this in quotes. Um, you can do precision, but that's about that. The rest is all up to quality control to save you. Um, all right, so, so ask for the validation report if there is one. This will help you understand the kind of variation that you're dealing with. Um, also, like I said, with the bias, you can get um, the appropriate reference ranges that should be in the validation report as well. Um, 
you will also know um, the stability of prep samples, and this will tell you um, how, how large your batches can be. So for example, um, I can use a GC example here. Um, GC, our GC untargeted method runs about an hour a sample, um, and GC is known to, to vary in time and vary uh, between batches. Um, so the moment you run you know, for longer than 24 hours, which means um, basically 24 injections, you're running into trouble. So you need to take that into consideration. And then obviously this may result in a lot of batches and then how you want to place those batches is, becomes important. Um, right. I think that's uh, about what I wanted to say here. Oh, what, just this um, on the, the comparing two groups comment that I've got there is when your method, um, the bias of your method is not known, right? Um, that's okay as long as you're comparing between two groups or you've got your own reference ranges, okay? Um, but imprecision and stability and so forth, you're not gonna get away from, you need to have that information. Okay, so here's some, some of the expert guidelines on, on what a good protocol looks like. Um, so a good um, analytical method, SFP, uses the biological sample efficiently. Obviously that's, that's great importance to all of us. Um, it generates samples in which the metabolite concentrations fall within the linear response range of the analytical method. But if, you're, if your samples or your concentrations are out of range, it really doesn't make sense to, to make use of that method. I'm sure that's, that's obvious. Um, the final sample solvent composition is matched to the chromatographic method. Okay, so that's not my field. I'm not going to delve any deeper. I see there's some um, lectures later on um, that cover this. Um, it should preserve the integrity of metabolites. It has as few steps as possible. Why? Because each and every step is an opportunity to increase your error, your measurement error. And then internal standards. Um, so even in the data analysis part of it, the internal standards play a crucial role. Um, so try to, to add the appropriate number of internal standards, but also internal standards in the appropriate concentration. And that will depend obviously on um, the compounds that you're interested in. Um, if you're working on targeted, try to use not just a single internal standard, um, because the, the, the reliance on a single internal standard just means that you, you end up with a standard that's, like I said um, earlier, sometime, somewhere in the middle of your chromatogram to make sure that everyone can reach it, all the compounds can reach it, you can see it like that. Um, but it also means that it has to be in a relatively high concentration to make sure that um, all the compound concentrations um, are, um, are traceable. I don't know if that's the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so finally, how do we make the most of our measurements um, or the analyses to get the best out of our samples? So measurement relies heavily, obviously, on your instrument, your sample prep, and then afterwards on your QC to make sure everything um, happened as you intended. Um, okay, so, in, so, so let's first look at the three main instruments. Um, so mostly we use NMR, GC, and LC. All right, so you can see here, um, the sensitivity, the differences in sensitivity, um, and how uh, of the various instruments, you can see that the NMR is the least sensitive. LC is, um, can cover the, the widest range, although as we saw earlier, not, or not everything. Um, and then obviously the polarity of the metabolites, which we also looked at earlier, um, is, is uh, better suited to some instruments than to others. So in our environment, we only actually use LC for targeted work, to my knowledge. Um, we use NMR um, in both ways, on targeted and targeted, like I said uh, previously. Um, and we primarily use GC for untargeted work. But I want to warn you here, GC is extremely um, involved. Um, the IDs are tentative and the quality control uh, needs to be solid, otherwise you're still going to run into trouble. Okay, so here's a comparison between firstly just NMR and mass spec, and then we'll get to a comparison between LC, uh, yeah, LC and GC specifically. So as we said, uh, NMR um, is the sensitivity is, is a downside here. Uh, mass spec is much more sensitive. It is um, selective, um, but 
uh, or in MRS is, uh, selectivity is good, but so so can uh, mass spec also if you've got um, depending on whether you're targeted or untargeted. Um, uh, let me see if I can. The reproducibility um, is of importance to me specifically because if the data is not uh, reproducible, then it again it leads you to um, basically invalid findings, right? So so this moderate to me is makes me a bit uncomfortable, but I know there's there are ways around this. Obviously, NMR um, is very reproducible. And I've seen that in practice as well. Um, sample preparation again, um, it's the, the all the prep step, steps add error to your measurement. So um, you, the, the benefit of NMR is obviously the minimal sample prep, and that's a huge benefit. Um, and you, you sometimes have to ask yourself if, if the loss of sensitivity is not worth um, the, the improvement um, or reduction in measurement, measure, measurement error, sorry. Um, Yes, and then as we know, sample prep in mass spec is, is often uh, you need derivatization and so forth, and there's a lot of room for error there. Um, yeah, so the number of detectable metabolites in urine um, in this example is, um, I think, also important. So due to sensitivity, obviously, in a more can detect less. Uh, they say you're 40 to 200. I've seen a little bit more, but OK. Um, you could be um, have more than 500 if you're using MS. We've seen into the thousands if you go untargeted. Um, and uh, yes, I think the rest you can source from this publication if you want a little bit more detail. Right now, let's look at how LC and GC compare. So let's say you've decided to go the mass spec route because you're interested in, um, I don't know, let's say lower concentrations. Um, then. How does GC and LC compare? So this is HPLC, but it's close enough. Um, right, so um, there's, there's a, a lot of stability issues, I almost want to say, that come into play here. Um, so depending on your sample prep again, so uh, it might you might run into trouble. So for instance, HPLC, um, you might do a dilute and shoot which means your sample is not necessarily as uh, stable as you would with the GCO derivatives, derivatized sample. Um, but again, um, this is more of a technical nature, so I'm not going to, to <laughs> say much more than that. These are just some of the, the things that you need to consider. So also um, when it comes to these instruments um, and you're talking columns and mobile phases and solvents and all of that, then, then the cost becomes a big thing. And that's actually the only thing that I really want to highlight here is that in terms of cost, um, GC beats LC. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Um, but again, you, you lose the range of metabolites and the range of concentrations that you might have, have had with LC. Okay. Um, sample prep, right. So no measurement is possible without some sample prep. All sample preparation adds um, to the potential error, which I've said now multiple times. Um, so choosing less complicated techniques will obviously help to reduce this error. Um, again, knowing the target analyte concentration will help to inform the choice of prep um, technique. Um, also, the attainable or how low you can go, the limit of quantification will be directly related to um, the specificity of your sample preparation technique. Um, so you can see here um, just basically some, some aims of sample preps. Um, so sample cleanup obviously increases um, your um, deconvolution, uh, improves your resolution. Um, but also if you're putting dirty things into your machines, then you need to clean them off as often and you need to service them more often. Um, if you want to increase your analyte concentrations, if that's the aim, um, but this is fantastic. Sample prep can help you with that. Um, then I think that's the two things that I wanted to touch on the most. Again, these, these references are, are available. Okay, so um, how do you choose the correct sample prep technique? Okay, so um, it depends on your goal, obviously. Um, so here they've, they've uh, given a couple of techniques um, on the left-hand side. And then um, how this influences your specificity. So obviously, if you want to be more specific, um, then you need to look at um, some of the lower SPE 
uh, kind of mechanisms. Um, and if you if you if you're not, um, then obviously it can be a little bit simpler than that. Um, okay, so again, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I just want to focus on the fact that that sample prep um, don't just look at the SOP provided or follow what's been done in the building for 20 years. Um, go and look at this yourself for your specific study for your specific needs. Um, a small change or alteration in the SOP might be to a great to your great benefit. Okay, um, like I said at the start, the golden rule of design is what you can't control, you should measure. So this is where QC comes in and plays an important role. Right, so the sample you choose as your QC determines your ability to assess and correct um, for measurement error. So, um, and this is actually your contradictory, it's not, it's measurement error in phenomena is contradictory, it's just not random measurement error, you can only correct for, um, can't correct for that. Okay. First, you should use um, a single sample as a QC. This, would, this is good practice for what, when it comes to untargeted. So this QC is probably more related to untargeted work um, because in targeted work, you've got a lot of other QC materials in, in place and you've got standards in place and so forth. So less of a concern there, but obviously still necessary. Here I'm referring more to, to the untargeted side. Um, okay, so... Um, you should have a single QC, that's usually the strategy, is you should have a single pooled QC, which you aliquot before you freeze it in. You don't want, I can't pronounce this correctly ever, uh, you don't want various freeze thaw cycles. Um, you want to keep everything as, as straightforward as possible, and you want to treat all the, the aliquots exactly the same, um, as well as not treating, uh, not, not, treating them as QC is the same, but also treating them exactly the same as the samples. So prep them the same, exactly the same treatment. Um, right, your QC should be representative of the compounds that's in your biological matrix. That's basically the whole reason why we pull QCs. Um, because if, you, if you've got an idea of what, um, or, or let me just say, put this differently, if you've got an idea of how um, your measurements has changed, which you can assess using the same sample, the QC sample, then you can get an idea of how you should adjust whatever else um, should, should be or could be reasonably expected to have changed in a similar way, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, this was also in the last year's presentation, so you can also reference it from there. I'm skipping ahead a bit. I want to see if I can do those two demonstrations for you. Um, okay, so let's just look at one thing again that's important, especially when you're doing untargeted work, is your batch design. So please check that the batches um, aren't too big, check the placement of the QCs and the frequency of them, check your run order, make sure that all your groups are represented in all your batches. Um, Check for replicates if you can. So in other words, don't just repeat your QC. Every now and again, repeat one of your actual samples. Uh, this allows you to see that if you did some sort of a QC correction, if that QC correction did what it expected. So um, let's say you saw there was a shift uh, between batches. Um, now you use your QCs to create a um, your response factor, a correction factor, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now your QCs are, are uh, in line. But when you look at a sample that was replicated um, in both bat batches, this sample is now completely different than you have to, that's, that's a red flag. Hopefully that won't happen. But it's also, the point is it's nice to also have replicates if you can afford it at all. Um, right, repeats, I know this happens, but watch out for, for repeats. So what I mean here is that if a sample fails to inject for some reason, please don't add it to the end of the batch, stick to your batch design. If an injection fails, you repeat it in a second batch. You re-prep, you do it from scratch. Um, don't just put the vial at the end again and, and try to re-inject. Okay, so that's the basic of that. Okay, so these are my famous last words. <laughs> How do you survive? Um, uh, so rest assured, everyone knows research is messy. I mean, even Einstein, like the quote says, um, if we knew what we were doing, um, it wouldn't be called research, would it? Okay, so <laughs> that's true. Um, but we have a responsibility to try. Uh, so here's my grill philosophy. 
Um, so before you even attempt to answer a research question using metabolomics, get to know the celebs in the field, right? So read, 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 uh, network as far as possible, read up on, on your question. I see this a lot. So, so students will get stuck on their research question and do a lot of research there. But don't forget to also look at how you get to the data, the samples, the instruments, the, all of what we've covered here. Um, don't skip to what you think your research will reveal. Right? So um, you have to first understand what data you require. So, so, so don't, don't, don't jump ahead, if that makes sense. Okay, also, um, if it hasn't been done using metabolomics before, there might be a very good reason for this. And I don't want to be negative here, <laughs> but this is the hardest truth. Uh, very few of our ideas are truly normal. So ask yourself, why, for instance, hasn't untargeted urine metabolomics been used to characterize this disease? It might be that it's just not possible. Right. Um, curb your enthusiasm. Um, even though less is more, more is not always better. Um, so a more refined research question might be more reserved, but it's also more precise. So ask yourself if you're biting off more than you can chew. Um, should the study maybe not be split into two research questions, for example? So, so often I would suggest that um, if the, the study is becoming too convoluted, then maybe uh, do a first round and a second round and let the first the results from the first round guide you to what the second one should be. Don't just immediately do NMR and LC, for instance. Do one and then, the, and then decide whether the other is still the best option. Go military. So <laughs> control as many of the sources of variation as possible. How subjects are selected, samples are collected, stored, sample prep, sample analysis, data analysis, we've, we've gone through it all. Um, and then milk it. Okay, so like I said, what you can't control, you have to measure. Get all the information you possibly can, especially if you're working clinical, get all the clinical information you possibly can on the samples you have. This will help a lot when you, when you get um, outliers or you get groups within groups and you want to try to understand what's happening there. Um, so I don't mean you don't walk in terms of get all the anal analyses or don't analyze your sample to, to death. I mean get all the, the other information that's available. Right, get a sleeping bag. Um, if you have uh, one chance, and most of us do, to perform an analysis due to sample volumes, funds, time, whatever, um, you better be sleeping next to the instrument. <laughs> These instruments are um, sensitive creatures, so, so take care of them. And finally, pray. Um, so no, no matter how well you plan, uh, life can still just suck, um, even if you're a student. <laughs> so in short, we have to do the best we can. Okay, and I think that's it. Um, I can maybe... Uh, Let's see if I can, do we have time still? I think we do. Yes, we're still good for time, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so let me uh, go to Metabo Analyst. Uh, so let me do this. Okay, can you see Metabo Analyst? I hope so. <laughs> okay, so, so yes. this is, okay, awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so this is Metabo Analyst, uh, for those of you who don't know it, very fantastic uh, piece of online software that's available. Um, you can basically just Google Metabo Analyst and you'll find, um, find it. Right, so um, I wanted to show you how you can do power calculations using Metabo Analyst. So if you go to click here to start. Hey, um, can yes. I, can I uh, ask you to give me like two minutes to I'll open up the meeting. I've set up a waiting room. Uh, okay. I'm getting a lot of uh, requests here of people who were not in the meeting yet. Um, okay. uh, I'll try and watch out for the disruptions, but let me let me. <laughs> That's fine. For now. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is the time, but I think um, I, I see there's one question in the chat um, that I think I can just maybe quickly address while we're while we're um, at it. Uh, so Deborah asked, is it better to run replicates in a batch or the entire sample set um, in a batch followed by the uh, respective replicates? Um, so, okay, so, so I'm assuming you're in a situation where, where you did the experiment and you replicated the experiment. 
Um, so as far as possible, you want to randomize when at all possible randomize. So um, to just answer your question is I would not do this because if you find a difference, you won't know whether it's the second set of replicates that's a problem or the batch that failed. So I'm not sure if that answers it, but I was thinking I saw the question I quickly addressed. All right, okay, so back to Metabo Analyst. So if you go to, let's just go home again. Okay, so this is the landing page from Metabo Analyst. Um, if you click here to start, uh, you'll see there's a block here that says power analysis. You can go there. Now, the awesome thing about the Tableau Analyst is they all, always have an example data set for you to try. So that's the one that I'm going to use. So I'm just going to say submit. Sorry, it usually takes a while. Okay, so um, those of you who are not familiar with the Tableau Analyst, please get familiar with the Tableau Analyst. <laughs> um, Right, so, so um, the trick to Metabo Analyst is simply to read. Um, all the information they provide you to you is, is important. So make sure that you read it and make sure that you agree with it. If you don't agree with it, um, then your data didn't import your data correctly or whatever. Okay, so this is not my data, so I'm happy. I'm going to proceed. Um, so they always, always want to do um, transformations and scalings. Uh, the reason simply being that for the, the stats machines, if you can <laughs> refer to them to that, um, to work is your data needs to look a certain way. So to get it to look a certain way, we do some transformation. So I'm going to assume that the normalization bit of it has been done, and I'm going to do nothing here, but I am going to just scale the data by doing a log transformation and reta scaling. This combination is my preferred one, um, but obviously you have to check if your data is okay. So let's proceed. Okay, so um, now you you uh, you'll see here again. You'll have to to read, but it, it's it's allows you to um, specify what you want to do here. So this is only two groups. So there's only one option that you can submit here. Um, but again, you have to read. So the test statistic, the t statistic, is expected to follow a near normal distribution. So that's a bell curve, right? Um, you should try different normalization algorithms if this shape is far from normal. Okay, so this uh, looks kind of normal to me. Um, some co compounds should be significantly different between the two selected conditions. Uh, you, you should see, sorry, some p-values close to zero. Right, so, so this is what they're, they're telling you. Um, you think you should, they think you should have something in the back. Right, so if you say submit now, then it gives you more detail. So the first page just says that, yes, you will find something. And then once you sort of submit this, then you can go and play around to get an idea of the sample size, okay? So um, let's say, so there's two ways that you can use Metallo Analyst in this way. You can use a pilot data set. So you've got a data set that is very similar to what you expect to generate in terms of sample size specifically, and in terms of um, effect size, so how big the difference is that you're expecting, then you can upload it here, and you can come to this page and um, understand if you play around a bit with, with these um, options, what your sample size should, should look like, or if the, usually it's the, the other way around, you try to see if the sample size that you have is sufficient. Um, okay, so this is, this is kind of where you play around a bit. Uh, so just to read through this, statistical power depends on the three main factors, the magnitude of the effective interest, the effect size, the uh, sample size um, used to detect the effect, the statistical significance criteria. So that's alpha or usually your false discovery rate. Okay. So the first factor, the effect size, um, is estimated from your pilot data. So you upload the data and they estimate it for you. The second factor, your sample size, is what you're going to be playing around with here, is um, your interest, that's what they say. So I you want to investigate the sample size versus the power to guide your next study design. The algorithm allows you to explore ranges of sample sizes from three to 1,000 per group. Um, you need to specify the third factor. This is the significance criteria, this is alpha. So you usually say P, um, we talk about P values less than 0 0.05, that's alpha, right? So uh, how low or um, how acceptable um, Oh, I'm going to put this. How comfortable are you with making a false discovery? So for a single biomarker, this is usually, like I said, the p-value of 5%. Um, but if you're doing, um, you know, if you're looking at more than one compound, you're doing multiple testing. And this means that you have to control for the fact that you've got more than one variable. You're testing 
or multiple variables. And this is where controlling the false discovery rate comes in. So they talk about the FDR adjusted p-value um, or adjusted threshold. So um, you can you can um, set this to 0 0.05, which is the one that we're most comfortable with. But like they explain here, this might be relatively strict, so you have to watch out. Um, but I mean, most journals um, want um, lock. Sorry. Um, are familiar with the five percent rule, so so let's say we we, we put it like this. Now let's let's take so just to make it interesting. Um, let's say we're in the um, awkward position of having only fifteen, which is actually not that bad in my experience. Um, fifteen um, uh, individual subjects, mice, whatever per group. Okay, if I now say submit, then you can see. Um, it predicts the power over the range of samples. So I said I've got a sample size of roughly 15. This gives me a power of just over um, 0.15 roughly. So that's a predictive power of 15%. This means that given the effect sizes that were observed in this data set, I only have a 15% chance of detecting the effect that I'm interested in when I've got 15 people per group. Can you, can you see that, the concern? Okay, so um, if I make this 150, then obviously the picture change. You can see, so by, when, you, when you get to 150, if I hover there, you see at 150, given the effect sizes that's in this data set, I have a 77.8% 70 chance of detecting the, the effects. Okay, so you see why I say our studies are always underpowered. But at least this gives you an indication of how bad the, the situation is. So um, I just want to, OK, so this is how you can, can check it preemptively or even retrospectively. Um, you can specify your actual sample size and see how far you got. So I think they had 13, I can't remember now, I think it was about 13. And they set this to 0 0.1. Um, and you'll see that's that's all right-ish. So at least you've got a roughly a 60% chance over there. I think if it's, I think it might be a little bit bigger than it's at least. But yeah, usually you want this to be at least above 0.8. Um, anyway, so you can go and play around with this um, in your own time. Um, there's a lot of um, help files and assistance available here. So if, if anything is unclear, you can just go and explore the internet. Well, you're obviously welcome to contact me. All right, the other software that I wanted to show you, or the app that I wanted to show you, was GStore Power. Um, so this is what the app looks like. I don't know if you just minimize this. A little bit less noisy. Um, okay, so GStore Power is is for um, univariate results mainly, but it allows for a little bit um, more complicated designs. So um, I'm going to do the most basic one, which is just comparing two groups. So I'm going to select here. You'll see there's a lot of stuff that you can select, but let's just keep it basic. So you can select a t-test. Um, then I just want to say, I want to compare the differences between two um, groups. So this is two independent means, OK? Um, and then if you're familiar with effect sizes for, for the t-test, it's usually um, Cohen's d-value. Um, so let's, and you'll see it gives you nice little guidelines, OK? so. Um, Let's say we're in, we're interested in a medium effect, um, and we are if we want p values of less than five percent, um, and here you can specify whether your groups are of equal size. So if the one's bigger than the other, um, then you need to change this ratio. Right. Okay. So now you can say calculate, um, and it gives you this um, explanation over here, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, and then it gives you this plot, which is actually what's, what the interesting part is. So now you can play around with this. So you can plot. So what I like to do usually is I like to um, plot my, um, uh, where is it now, power on my y-axis. So this will be displayed here. But you can see you've got multiple options that you can go and play around with. And then um, I want to plot it as a function of the total sample size. Okay, So that's the one way to do it. Um, and you can specify the effect size as this, and the values of um, your alpha is 0.5 here again. Okay, so now you can see to get a power of 80, 
for this t test, I need about a sample size of 100. <laughs> Can you see why, why, why our studies aren't about it? Okay, so, so how, do we, how do we work with this? Well, firstly, we can say that, okay, I don't want necessarily a p-value of 5%. I think a 10% cutoff is, is fine. I'm only interested in very large effect sizes, right? Um, and we can check uh, what, this, what the plot looks like there. So, okay, if you're interested in very large effects, um, then you can see you can settle for about 20 at a 10% at a significance level. So you can see how, how you can play around and use this tool a bit to, to see, um, to see what, what would be a better solution for, for your study. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show you the other thing is you can save the plot, which is great. So you can, if a trick asks you for more information, you can go to file, print plot, save plot. You've also got a table um, with the details. Um, and if you, okay, so we've done that. Um, you can also get the details of how you've calculated it from here, which you can also export to ATREC. It's got um, export and provide to ATREC. Um, what's very helpful is the help files. Um, I'm going on this one. So um, I think it's over here. No. Anyways, um, it, it might be online. I might not have looked at it in a while. Um, so, that, so there's a lot of help files available on this as well. Um, and what I like especially is the fact that you can do more advanced tests. Um, so F tests and chi squared tests and so forth, um, which means that you can over year look at um, regressions and, and um, stuff and you can even do non-parametric ones, which is, which is great. So this is also a, a useful tool. Again, what you can do is once you find your, uh, let's say you use the Tabo Analyst and you've got your markers and you're happy, then you can take the information for that specific marker or important metabolite and you can pop it in here and see and, and calculate the power and see for that specific uh, metabolite what what is the power where's your power at and see whether you can confidently say that that's a new discovery or not okay i think that's that's what i've got for you today Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think there are more questions in the in the chat there. Uh, Prof Zeno says, does this mean that you can get uh, a p-value of less than 0 0.05 for a very small effect if if you get a very big number of samples? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, and then there's a follow up. Uh, what power level is acceptable for for a good general? Um, okay, so the power of less than 80% is usually um, frowned upon. <laughs> so 80% is, I think, the, the bare minimum. Um, but um, like everything in life, you can argue it um, in various different ways. But I would say 80%. So um, that's the, the good journal cutoff, <laughs> not the bad journal cutoff. Uh, okay, so just to get back to the previous question, um, yes, uh, the same as, as or the, can I say, the, the inverse of an underpowered study is an overpowered study, which is just as problematic. I just tend to not discuss it because we never have that many samples. But yes, it does happen that if you have a very large sample size that it picks up even the smallest thing. So um, the example that I like to use is like, um, I don't know if you can remember the cartoon in the presentation where Sansa was looking for chimneys. So just like, um, like that, if you've, if you've got a, if it's very dark, you've got a small flashlight, then you can't pick up much, but the, the, the um, alternative is also true. If you've got the sun shining down on a piece of paper, you will spot um, the, small, the, the, you know, the slightest inconsistency in the paper. So, so that's kind of, the um, reverse is also true. Okay. Um, you you may have touched on this, and I was I was busy fighting off the. the <laughs> uh, what what tends to happen is that uh, postgraduate students tend to inherit samples, 
So if you're starting your master's, you could be using samples from a previous PhD student or honor student. Uh, and 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 I'm a, and I'm sample handling could 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 essentially introduce uh, variation into into the sample. Is there a way of controlling that or at least factoring that into into the analysis? Um, yeah, I think we're all at the mercy of that. Um, I knew I know a few students that, that are especially masters levels that are um, privileged enough to go and collect their own samples. So I think that um, uh, that that is the harsh reality. Um, so th that's the the point that I wanted to make throughout is keep track of everything. And, and I think this should be at a departmental level. So if there is anything that's, that um, happened to a sample that, that might be a little bit borderline to the SOP or a breach of the SOP or whatever, that should be documented. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to have your peer, poor student find some sort of a subgroup um, within your, I don't know, let's say healthy control group and say that these guys aren't actually healthy controls, they are progressing towards the disease and go down this whole rabbit hole on some illusion that there is actually a biological reason when it's actually just sample handling. So the only thing that you can do is find out um, as much as possible. So, um, you know, students, um, most students that, that I'm aware of aren't allowed to take their lab books when they leave, their lab books stay here. And it's for this purpose. So a, a good advice to a student would be to, um, to ask, ask for any available information, ask for lab books, ask for site notes, ask for whatever is available. Um, if you're sourcing samples from, from like a biobank, um, you, you should be lucky in the sense that that's more controlled. Um, if it's not, if it's just, um, you know, local hospital collecting samples, um, then I would do a site visit. Um, you might find that, oh, stupid example, but let's say um, Friday nights are not a good time to collect samples for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, so you might want to, I don't know, try to not include as many Friday night samples um, as you would, for instance, Wednesday samples. Um, so again, information is power. Um, that's about the only advice I can give. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Mason had a comment in there. I don't know if you want to expand on, on that. Um, Shandy, you want to expand? Do you mean we need reference materials? If, if that's what you mean, then yes, I agree. <laughs> No, I guess you 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 got you got what he meant there. Uh, all right. Uh, if anyone has or oh, there's a hand up, uh, I think okay. Uh, Wilma, go ahead. Marie, um, I know that we're now supposed to use Metabo Analyst to determine how many samples we should take. But if I now want to design an experiment and I, do, I, I don't have the opportunity to do a, a preliminary study first, uh, what should I aim for? What should the ratio be of samples to variables or metabolites that I want to look at? <laughs> Just a rule of thumb, sort of do I say 30 you're samples? Not, <laughs> you're not gonna like the answer. <laughs> Okay, so, so when I, in quotes, grew up, um, our rule of thumb in the stats departments, that's before I moved here and re realized the real world doesn't work that way, our rule of thumb was 10 observations for every variable. So, okay. so that's, yeah. Okay, so, no, so that means if, you, if you're measuring 400 compounds, you're talking 4,000 samples. Okay. Um, obviously, not. you know, because I I um, review a lot of articles, and and I really feel that the amount of samples where they're comparing to the amount of metabolites are just not big enough, the sample mm -hmm. size. But I have never well um, get to a, got to a point where I can say, okay, that is too few samples. But mm -hmm. okay, so it's for every ten variables, how many samples did you say? 
Now, for every variable, 10 samples. <laughs> okay. One sample. You see why I'm one. laughing. <laughs> Um, okay. okay. No, but 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 the thing is, so it is a bit con context specific. Um, so I've had my battles with Itrek. Um, look, if it's if it's animal samples or if it's cell lines or if it's you know if it's really controlled uh, subjects, then I I don't think um, your sample sizes have to be that large because you're technically working with replicates. It's technically not. Or in my mind, I've convinced myself <laughs> that it's actually the same thing that you same subject that you're measuring more than once, because they're so genetic. Or they're supposed to be so similar, and the, the environment okay. that they're living in is very similar. So, so that I kind of I can stomach. Um, when it comes to yeah, you know humans, it's 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 messy. Um, so it's it's, it's very difficult. Um, what, what I always say is that the idea is to get an idea of effect size, not significance. So what we do is we focus, uh, we, we focus um, on effect sizes and move away from this extreme emphasis on the p-value because the p-value has flaws in, of its own, um, a lot of flaws. I can do a whole presentation on that. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is to say that um, your p-value is dependent on your sample size, highly dependent on your sample size, your effect size less so. So when you interpret your results, you interpret it considering effect size um, and to some extent almost ignoring p-values. Um, and then, uh, like I said, uh, if, you, if you really do find something, um, and this, in my opinion, is only applicable when you're working targeted and you know that this is what the compound is and you've got the actual concentrations and all of that. Um, and you, you're saying that this is a new disease marker. If you're at that point and you're not sure about your sample size, um, then uh, or you want to say this, but you think the reviewer is going to hammer you on, on, uh, on your sample size, then you come to something like g stop power and you actually calculate the power. And you can do that retrospectively. So I can maybe show you quickly what you would do. So let's say you've got a specific compound that differs between two groups in terms of the mean. So you keep the setting as it is. Now you say, I found an effect size of 2.48 for this difference, right? Um, and you can say that you want to be, you can keep this at um, five percent, so that means you want to. There's only a five percent chance that you might be wrong. Right? So you want to keep it at that. You can even make it lower. Um, okay, but let's keep it at that. And then let's say then that you aiming for a power of at least eighty. Um, and now, if you calculate, um, oh, sorry, you just have to calculate to get to here actually. So um, this is the effect size that you actually got. Um, you don't want you want plot the power against this might work. Sorry, I'm playing around a bit as we go along. Okay, so let's let's do it this way around. So you would come here and then you would say you want to plot your power against your alpha, which is the cutoff for your p-value, because these are the things that you're not really in control of, right? Um, but you do have is the effect size that you've actually attained through your study. So that's the two point whatever. Um, and you do have your total sample size. Let's say that was 20, okay? And if you now draw the plot, then you can see your power is sufficient given a significance level of at least five. Okay, so we're kind of off the chart here. So let's, let's just rescale here. So let's say I wanna make this, I want it to go from 1.1 to 0 0.1, just so that this plot is more in perspective. Okay, so you can see that you can you can um, get away with even um, larger um, probabilities. Oh, this is the error probability. Sorry. Um, okay. Any case, sorry, I just need to. There's a setting here that needs to be changed. I can't remember well. But any case, so you can come here and you can specify your your total sample size and you can specify the effect size that you actually observed. And then you can go and, and look for, for what the power, um, you can expect the power to be um, given your, um, the p-value that you think is appropriate. You can even specify the specific p-value that you got, but okay, does, does this kind of make sense? Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm winging it. 
Yeah, I, I understand, yeah. There was a hand up. Uh, there's another hand there, uh, Deborah. Yes, uh, thank you. I was just thinking that I think a lot of this relates to <clears throat> relate to biomedical research or medical research, but I'm thinking of it in terms of biological re uh, research in terms of agriculture. So then imagine we go to the field and we get maybe an insect or a plant that we think is having an effect on uh, a host plant. And we want to see what kind of metabolites they are, um, that particular organism is producing to negatively affect the plant. Now, we don't have the, if, if I may say luxury of having a large sample size of that particular organism. So then what are our, our, our options? for designing this kind of experiment? Um, okay, so I would say that you are in a similar um, scenario as um, someone doing uh, lab rats, um, to put it bluntly, because when it comes to, to humans, we eat differently, we, we live differently, we whatever, but insects, I'm assuming, I'm not, not a, um, an expert, but I'm assuming that insects, um, in the same area, roughly behave the same, eat the same, um, experience the same, which means that um, your variation between your subjects should be way less um, than the, you know, the variation that you're interested in, which means your signal is bigger than your noise. So that would be my argument, um, is that you're essentially you're in an in a controlled environment because these animal or these insects aren't. You know, the one doesn't like Kentucky and the other one Nando's. They're, they're all eating the same plant. So um, I think it should be okay. I don't know if that helps. Um, yes, it helps in a way. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands or comments in there. In the chat box. Uh, any more questions for for Marie? I guess not. Okay. Uh, did you did you have anything else to add, Marie, or should we should we break off? Now? Um, no, I think that's all from my side. Um, I'll ask. Um, the organizers just a little bit later how I can distribute um, the references that I used. I think they're, they're, they'll be helpful, maybe more helpful than the actual presentation. Okay, okay, that's, that's fair. Um, let me see on my end. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's that for, for the morning session. Uh, uh, let me first uh, start by apologizing to everyone about what happened this morning. Uh, what we tried to do is to make these meetings easier to, to join and easier to manage, because if you have a, a waiting room, you have to click and accept people, which, which can be a bit of an admin. Uh, but we learned the hard way that the, these measures are in place for a reason, uh, and we'll try and, 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 and watch out for that. Uh, for now, I have the waiting room, so I'm allowing people in. So if, if say you get locked out for some reason, I'll be able to let you back in. Uh, but once the mid morning session starts, I'll probably lock the session at some point, but I'll give people room to, 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 to log in and log out. Um, so before, because we know it's a, it's a whole day thing, we'll give you guys a chance to go check on your emails and make some coffee. And then we'll resume again at 11 o'clock, if that's okay with everyone. So that we stick to the times in case some people were, 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 were eyeing specific sessions so that we don't, we don't uh, throw them off. Uh, so let's take a 30 minute break and then we'll come back at 11 for the, the mid morning session. Thank you so much, Marie, for, for the session. Always very, very informative. Uh, and we'll hopefully see you in the later sessions.
bottom line. Um, you will have to determine, um, separate and identify in some way before you can identify the constituent. So you either have to have the mass or um, uh, the mass spectrum or the NMR or um, the UV uh, uh, spectra so that you can start with something to go and look how to identify it online. And then obviously, if you have standards, then you can be sure you are working with the right constituent. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, well, we, we, we can take it further after in the afternoon session uh, of your life, you still have need more clarification. Uh, the, uh, thank you, Malati. Yeah. Thank you, Malati. All right, everyone, uh, please enjoy your lunch. We'll see you back here at quarter past one.